Well, it's important to note that this is uh, Chair Carlson's uh, final budget setting forecast. He will be here for one more uh, budget forecast in November before his term of service ends, but we're certainly going to miss his uh, wise voice on these issues. Uh, with regard to the budget forecast, it's important to understand that that is a projected positive balance based on the budget that we set last year. And it's only a surplus in the true sense of the word if Minnesotans feel that we've invested all that we need to in education, health care, and families economic security. We think that there are important investments yet to make in families, education, health care, and economic security. And so we view the uh, projected positive balance as an opportunity to invest in Minnesota's families. It's also really important with the potential of a downturn uh, in the future that we invest big in the bonding bill. I think the governor uh, made a really good case for uh, taking advantage of the incredibly low rates we have right now for borrowing. And with that, I will introduce Lyndon Carlson. Well, thank you, and uh, Madam Speaker, thank you for the kind uh, comments. Uh, yes, last November I did uh, announce that uh, this would be my final year in the legislature. That completes 48 years next December 31st, but thank you for that acknowledgement. Well, um, I was asked this morning in the tax committee uh, to make a prediction about uh, what the forecast would look like, and I said I didn't think there would be dramatic change because of uh, having sat in on the uh, November forecast, and I think that's what we see uh, before us. There's some additional uh, funding that's available uh, moving forward uh, permanently, and then a lot of uh, one-time money. But uh, my goal is uh, not too different than uh, what you've heard already. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, have a vigorous bonding bill passed. Uh, this is a timely uh, opportunity because interest rates are low. And so we'll be working uh, closely, uh, and that's with the other caucus, because that's the kind of bill that uh, takes cooperation. You need 81 votes. But uh, hopefully we'll have a uh, robust uh, bonding bill. And that's, I think, what the governor was saying. Um, some of you know that my background uh, was in education. I was a teacher for 33 years. And one thing that uh, I'm concerned about and I would like to see some movement on is uh, the achievement gap. And I'm an absolute believer that part of the solution is in early childhood education. So this session, my last session, uh, I hope we'll have a good bonding bill and that we can move forward on uh, early childhood education along with some other issues. But personally, uh, those would be a couple of my uh, priorities, and I think we're well set with the forecast to, uh, to do a lot of good things uh, this legislative session. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to point out a couple of cautionary notes. Uh, we have everything in place, I think, to have a positive legislative session. Legislative leaders of both parties are uh, willing to work together and having good conversations already on bonding, uh, insulin, and all various other subjects. Uh, and I think we can get a uh, supplemental budget that is helpful for Minnesota and do some of the things that uh, Chair Carlson talked about and we've proposed in early childhood. <laughs> but looking out in Minnesota's future, we have some trouble spots. First of all, if you put inflation in the forecast, as we should, we are looking at a $654 million deficit in the next biennium. So just to maintain the same level of service as we have today, we are going to be short $650 million. Second of all, if you look at the uh, workforce that Minnesota has, we are short workers for the jobs that we need to fill. And we are not going to be able to do that through a sudden population boost internally. We have to make Minnesota a more welcoming state for others to move in. Uh, we need to have immigration policies that welcome people into our state and make them feel integrated into our communities. Our communities need to be open to outsiders and bringing people in. And it's encouraging to see recent polling showing so many Minnesotans supporting refugees moving into Minnesota. A lot of our future is going to be tied up in bringing new people into our state and working together, functioning to be together better, as well as continuing our tradition of strong investments in education and health care to make sure that our existing workforce is as well prepared for the future as possible and is healthy enough to do the job. So looking out ahead, we have a real priority on public investments and health and education, and that is exactly what Minnesotans are saying we need to continue doing. So we feel good about our ability to meet this challenge, but there are some real challenges ahead. 
Good afternoon. Uh, before session, when we did one of our panels with the four leaders, we joked that there was a lot of kumbaya happening at that point. Um, and I think you're going to continue hearing some of that, um, although there will, of course, be some parts of departure, of departure when I think you hear from the, the leaders of the other caucuses. Um, as we've discussed, we have good news today in the, in the forecast, um, but we also know that this is, um, we need to protect fiscal stability for the state of Minnesota. Uh, the Senate DFL caucus has been committed to this throughout, and that stays today. Uh, we know that by keeping a solid, steady budget working, not going into structural deficits, we are able to do the business of the people of Minnesota and take care of the priorities that take care of our families and our futures. Um, when we go into structural deficits, and we know because of potential economic downturns, and we know that uh, the, the just the projections as uh, Majority Leader Winkler just mentioned in terms of inflation, that we are looking at budget challenges in the out years. And so this is not the time to do, make drastic moves that would commit us into the wrong direction into the future. There are things we can do. Um, the, a, a great bonding bill is something that we've all been talking about. We know that that is investment that is needed to be made into our communities. And we know that that will put people to work in really good jobs. And we need to be sure and do that. Um, and with the, with the budget, uh, supplemental opportunities. We've talked about the budget reserves. We've talked about making smart investments in our futures and making sure that we continue to save for a rainy day because it is, it is something that we need to be um, prudent about. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome Senator Ann Rest. Um, uh, thank you, um, Senator Ken. I'm going to be kind of the anti-kumbaya here. <laughs> um, I do uh, want to draw your attention in the um, uh, in the uh, booklet that you got to uh, page three, where uh, the department um, calls to your attention what the forecast risks are. Um, consumer confidence, where people continue to buy at the rate that they're doing now. The financial market volatility that we're seeing with regard to the coronavirus that is um, making its uh, way into our country. Um, that uh, our trade policy uncertainty with regard to the federal government, the prolonged and widespread virus outbreak, what we've already mentioned, and that we have 16 months to go before the end of this, um, uh, the end of this biennium. We do have a positive forecast. And we should make the most of it um, by being cautious, by setting our priorities that um, uh, respect and value uh, Minnesota's families uh, with regard to early education, as uh, Representative uh, Carlson mentioned. Uh, if we're going to do one-time spending, other than maybe uh, speeding up, paying back the reserve, um, that we do it uh, in uh, activities that res that reflect our, uh, our values, early education, um, affordable, uh, affordable uh, housing, and certainly uh, making our schools safe for all of, um, all of Minnesota's children. So we have, um, we're in a good point now, but um, we shouldn't waste it um, with reckless uh, tax bills that are being um, promoted right now by the um, Senate Republicans, uh, where they would spend almost this whole budgetary balance um, on uh, unsustainable tax cuts. We should have a very serious conversation about the relationship of this budgetary balance with uh, Minnesota's tax policy and, um, and not rush into anything. Thank you. If you're worried about inflation, then just don't spend the surplus, right? First of all, we're trying to be really careful about not calling it a surplus because sometimes what that indicates to people is that it's sustainable. And this is not sustainable because of inflation. And so if we're going to do any one-time spending other than paying back the, the, um, uh, the budget reserve, which we're on a path to do anyway, out a couple of years, it seems to me that we need to um, be very 
very restrained, maybe do things that are emergencies, like the governor was talking about in his remarks. Um, but other than that, we need to be uh, very careful taking into account these, um, uh, these risk factors, even though it shows that we're improved over, <laughs> over no November by some $200 million. So it's, um, uh, it's not really doom and gloom, but uh, the uncertainties that are in our economy and, our, and in uh, uh, health scares, um, we can take care of those in Minnesota, but we need to be very cautious about over-promising what we can't deliver. Particularly exempting Social Security. Well, right now, the vast majority of people who receive uh, Social Security income in the state of Minnesota do not pay taxes on that income, and anybody who is solely dependent on their Social Security income does not pay taxes on that income in the state of Minnesota. But with regard to any proposals that we look at this year, what we will look at is the ongoing structural balance of the state budget. I think it was an important Mark Dayton uh, budget legacy, and um, I think the shoulders that Governor's, Governor Walls was talking about standing on was um, Governor Dayton and uh, Commissioner Franz being very committed to not getting into a situation that Mark Dayton faced when he became governor in 2011. So uh, we can't afford the, the size of proposals, uh, the spending that Republicans are putting forward. And we especially can't afford a, a proposal to cut taxes that tilts towards people who are wealthier. Madam Speaker, I'm sorry. Did, if, did you just say the vast majority of Minnesotans don't pay, who earn Social Security, don't pay taxes? I, am I mistaken? I thought the number was about half pay something. Oh, well, the, the numbers uh, given by the governor, which I'm going to assume are accurate, at the, uh, the pre-session presser were that there's about $19 billion worth of Social Security income paid into the state of Minnesota, and $5 billion of that is taxed. And of that $5 billion that uh, folks pay taxes on, those folks are overwhelmingly in the upper income categories. But it, it so is I would say, I mean, my rough math says that 75% to me, that's vast majority. I think that's the difference between dollar amounts and number of people. Yeah. <laughs> Send a tax, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I believe, and I don't have the, um, the numbers right in front of me, but it's, I think it's about 46% of Minnesotans that receive Social Security don't pay taxes on any of it. None of us that receive Social Security pay taxes on the first 15 percent. We have made two attempts uh, over the last four years to, um, to um, achieve uh, bracket uh, anti-bracket creep um, uh, proposals. and. Um, there certainly are uh, ways that we can uh, help people who are in the lower income levels that are still struggling with uh, paying taxes on their Social Security. But if you do a blanket um, exemption of all so Social Security, I mean, I really don't see why we should feel any obligation whatsoever to people that have $300,000 in in income, including Social Security, to exempt uh, any of their uh, income above that that uh, fifteen percent that they too that they too uh, don't have to pay taxes on. But if we're going to have an end of session deal, Speaker, won't you need to have some tax uh, relief in it in order to make a deal with divided government? Because that seems to be a priority of the Senate. Any end of session deal on uh, the using the project, projected positive balance will have to have some elements that make Republicans happy and some elements that make Democrats happy. Would full federal conformity be a piece that might make them happy that you would be okay with? Uh, well, we're at the very beginning of the tax conversation, and so our tax chair, I'm sure, will be diving into um, all the proposals on that front. And I think you can expect um, pretty good alignment between the administration and and House Democrats. Uh, the governor, sorry, just going to follow up. The governor said that he was okay with some open to some ongoing spending. What areas might you and the, the Senate Minority Leader be interested in seeing ongoing spending? Well, for our caucus, we put a really big marker out there on early childhood education. We truly believe that when you look at the investments that we can make in the state of Minnesota, the investments that we make in people are the most important investments we can make, and the investments that we make in children between birth and age three are the most significant of all. 
So even if we can't make an ongoing commitment to next year's three-year-olds, we know we have enough money to invest in this year's three-year-olds, and we know if we do make those investments that they'll carry the benefits of those investments with them for the rest of their life. So our highest priority would be early childhood education. Madam Speaker, since you mentioned that, that the final deal is going to have to make both sides happy, if the price of getting what you want is too high being um, the trade-off, are you willing to walk away and leave this money aside, given the caution that everyone's preaching today that maybe it's not prudent to, to spend it all? Well, I think when you look at uh, fiscal years 22 and 23, and that there is a projected deficit of $654 million, uh, I think that there is uh, definitely a benefit for Minnesotans to letting all the money fall to the bottom line. Madam Speaker, you probably heard about the OLA report on corrections yesterday. I'm wondering if that puts a sense of urgency on the need to spend some money within corrections to correct some of the really serious problems that they uncovered in that study. Well, I think the governor spoke very well to the, the uh, intense need we have to invest in those facilities. You know, um, Chair Mary Murphy is requesting a large number for a target for geo bonding, and the reason why she wants uh, a large target is that we can do that within our AAA bond rating, but also there is significant uh, backup need out there. There are investments that we have neglected for years, and we have an accumulated uh, backlog of investments that we need to make. And what Chair Murphy has suggested to uh, Minority Leader Doubt is that let's go big this year, and then let's make a commitment to all of these state institutions that we are going to be there at a steady pace over the next several years so that they can stay caught up. Some of what they wanted wouldn't have fallen within bonding would have been in investments in data collection, at massive levels of data collection. Is that something that you could see investing in this year? It's nice that we have a, a, a positive, a projected positive balance that we can take a look at doing some of those things. Madam Speaker, the additional amount, and I realize it's a fairly small amount on a percentage basis in the surplus, but does this strengthen your resolve in terms of what the governor terms a robust bonding bill, and it sounds like you're going to be even more robust than he is, if you're if we're understanding you correctly. Uh, well, I know Chair Murphy had one question at the forecast briefing, and she and her question was, does this, um, uh, so does this do these numbers support a bonding bill of at least $3.5 in general obligation bonds and $700 million in cash? And the answer she got from the budget professionals was yes. So that is the request I have from my chair. And is that what, you, what the House is going to, what your caucus is going to bring forward, Madam Speaker? We will just be starting the budget resolution setting process over the next uh, two weeks. And then at the end of the third week, I would expect around March 23rd, you'll see what our proposed budget is. We'll, we'll take a, a serious look at what the governor puts on the table on March 10th. <laughs> And I will just add, um, from the, the Senate DFL perspective, um, in speaking specifically about the bonding side and the, and the um, projected, budget, uh, projected budget projection that we have that we're looking at, um, definitely looking at the, the budget reserves and making sure that we are on a, a good path to get that uh, replaced quickly. Um, and you know some of the things that we keep hearing about from around our state, all corners of the state, oftentimes from um, the business community, certainly the need for workforce housing and affordable housing. Um, that is an area where you can see bonding being leveraged um, to get tax credits and uh, private financing and other local financing uh, and to make a real difference that would help um, families and workers and uh, employers, which would help address some of these challenges that our state is seeing um, in terms of, the work of uh, our overall economic capabilities being hampered by some of these workforce issues. I had someone in my office just yesterday uh, from a construction firm who, was, who lit, specifically said that they can't take on as many jobs as they want to, as they would like to be able to, because they do not have the people available to, to do that work. And so that is where our focus needs to be. It needs to be on the kinds of things that help lift the economic engine of Minnesota so that we are strong moving forward into the future. Bonding is a huge part of that. I think we do have a really unique opportunity to do something um, pretty, pretty special um, that can make a real difference in Minnesotans' lives across the state. Uh, but also, you know, looking at these opportunities where we can make a difference without putting us into structural deficits. Madam Leader, if I may, just a quick follow-up in your conversations with Senator Gazelka on this, because obviously he needs you folks' support to do this. Um, is the two billion that the governor is proposing what what you're telling him it needs to be at, or does it need to be higher than that, or what kind of conversation are you having with him? 
What I'll say at this point, um, and this has included also the speaker and the minority leader in the House, is we are having really good conversations about starting this process and that we are going to work together. Um, and I think we are all uh, cautiously optimistic that we're going to be able to do this in a healthy way um, and avoid some of that end of session um, process that we've seen in the past. And I'm really committed to that myself. Uh, so, But at this point, we're not going to talk about specific numbers and where we are. Thank you.